So WrestleMania 33 has come and gone. It's officially in the books. And the first thing I have to say is I actually watched the entire show, meaning the two hours of the kickoff show and the five hours of the actual main car. And let me tell you, not as young as I used to be. That's a long fucking haul. That is a lot of professional wrestling to pack into one night. It's too much. You get to the point where you get to about 10, 1030 Eastern time and you're starting to say, eh, it's kind of getting to be too much. Enough is enough. And yet the show festers and lingers on. WWE, I beg you, for the life of you, for the life of me, for everybody involved, please figure out a way to cut this shit short a little bit next year. Seven hours with the two hours of pre-show. Even if you don't watch the pre-show, just five hours of actual main card is too damn much. I should feel tired after watching a WrestleMania because it was so exhilarating and so thrilling and it had so many heart-stopping moments that I couldn't contain myself and I'm just emotionally spent because of that. I shouldn't feel spent because it literally felt like a chore, a laborious job to have to sit there and sit through all of the show. But anyways, that's what I did. I decided if I was going to do it this year, I was going to get the full experience. And boy, did I ever. So let's go ahead and talk about what is sure to be a memorable WrestleMania 33. Uh, looking at the kickoff show, uh, the Cruiserweight Championship match between Austin Aries and Neville. It was okay, just okay. You know, it's kind of one of the these things where it's a theme that you see sprinkled in throughout a lot of the matches on the WrestleMania card in terms of just because there are a couple of spots doesn't mean the match was great. And for the Cruiserweights, you know, they need to be that type of high-impact type of style. And when they do a lot of map-based wrestling, it just forces them to kind of blend into the crowd. They don't really stand out. Now, with that said, I thought Neville and Aries had flashes and moments of some good action and some good psychology. And let's face it, at the end of the day, it was what it was. The WWE doesn't give a shit about this division. Most of you don't give a shit about the pre-show. So it happened. Neville retaining was a bit surprising. But hey, not every title can change hands at WrestleMania. So now there's a reason for the story to continue, and I'm okay with that. Uh, the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. You know, heading into this, I think there was a lot of money on Braun Strowman winning. You built this dude up like a monster for an extended period of time. Here is a moment where you can give him a WrestleMania moment. Only you have him come out down that 300-yard fucking ramp to eliminate Big Show and then have literally everybody eliminate him. At which point in time, there was an overwhelming feeling of dread, thinking that the Uber driver or the suspect sissy could potentially win this damn thing. But there was also that hope that maybe there would go somebody else. You know, Mark Henry was there for a moment. I was like, oh, oh could it be? Yeah, it wasn't meant to be there either. Um, but Mojo Raleigh. <laughs> boy, oh boy. This was an interesting decision. Clearly the only reason this decision was made, they put this battle royal on in the second hour of the pre-show because I believe they were showing the second hour of the kickoff show on the USA Network, so they wanted to have... It where Gronkowski was featured on cable television, even though they didn't advertise his appearance ahead of time, and even though the USA Network does not actually show football. With that said, though, the thing that was the most striking to me, other than the awesome Mark security guard that treated Gronkowski like, A, this wasn't planned from the very beginning, and B, like this bitch was actually going to do something to rob Gronkowski. Give me a fucking break. He could curl your ass with his left arm that you were grabbing onto. She was about two steps away from humping his fucking leg. That's how badly she was trying to hold him back. It's funny because it's like she's the shit security guard that they don't make smart to think. <laughs> there was actually a highlight of the match. I marked out for that as much as anything. Uh, but when Gronkowski got in there, 
you, you sit there and you look at him, and even compared to Mojo, you're like, God damn. Gronk looks like the WWE future main eventer. Why the hell is Rob Gronkowski not in the WWE? And for those that are going to complain about this finish, complain about Gronkowski getting involved, and complain about Mojo Raleigh winning, keep this in mind. It's the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. It also happened on the pre-show. And the combination of those factors, most certainly because of this match, doesn't fucking matter. This finish, frankly, doesn't fucking matter. So let's get over it and move the fuck on. I opined in my uh, preview show that they were going to have to move a third match um, to the pre-show. They had to. There's just no way. And you see the fact, even with the ten matches on the main card, the show still took five hours. And it feels like only half of that five hours was actually in-ring action. If that, you know, when we weren't running commercials about the WWE Network on the WWE Network, so that way we can get some people that are legally streaming this shit that already aren't paying for the network to potentially subscribe for the free month for whatever fuck reason, you needed to put a third match on the card, on the pre-show. And the IC title match was the perfect choice. At least it was defended at WrestleMania in some capacity. But Baron Corbin and Dean Ambrose, who gives a shit? Most certainly, Dean Ambrose clearly doesn't give a shit. In a little over four years, this dude went from being one of the hottest people in the company as a part of the hottest faction in the company in The Shield to wrestling in the pre-show and a kickoff match. Holy cow. I mean, if dude just doesn't care, step aside and let somebody else take your spot that actually fucking does. I could sit there and be a wise ass and say, hey, at least with getting your match done early and out of the way, you can ensure yourself at the Citrus Bowl that you're going to get hot water for your shower. But we're talking about Dean Ambrose here, bitch, please. Watch your ass, my ass. Match was bad, and clearly you saw by the end of it, especially with Ambrose retaining, why it belonged exactly where the hell it was, which was on the pre-show. The match was a joke, and Dean Ambrose is a fucking joke, and I'm sorry, but if he's future Endeavor tomorrow, who's really going to bat an eye? You want to talk about being complacent and not giving a shit, and most certainly not trying to improve your abilities at your craft, you're talking about him. But anyways, the kickoff show was just two hours of time kill to prepare you for five more hours of it. Oh my god. So let's talk about the main card. Shane McMahon, AJ Styles. I thought it was interesting that they were just going to go with this being a regular wrestling match. And then I thought it was really weird, in, to a degree, that this match kicked off the show. But then I thought about it, if you're trying to get people hyped up for the show, and you still got a ton of matches, you got to put something decent here. So maybe Shane and AJ made some sense, because it wasn't the most interesting story that you had, but you had to feel with AJ Styles in there and Shane McMahon in there, that they would be capable of potentially doing something at least halfway decent to get you off to a good start. You need a match that can get you off to a good start. And at the end of the day, that's exactly what the hell this match did. Now, for my money, I do not like ref bumps in the opening match of a WrestleMania. I think it's ridiculous. Especially if it's just an excuse to have Shane and AJ basically play crash test dummies for several minutes. If you were going to do that, then this should have been some type of street fight stipulation or something, knowing that as much as same Shane McMahon tries to pull off those Ricky Steamboat rip-off arm drags, it's just not going to work, knowing that a McMahon match will get over in part because Vince and now Shane will do whatever it takes to try and get the damn thing over, it should have had a step special stipulation to begin with, not a damn referee bump. Uh, but with that said, the match was fine. It was more than fine. There will probably be a number of people that think that it's the match of the night, and I don't know how much of a disagreement they're going to get from me. In terms of the most well-pieced-together match, other than the ref bump, this might have been it. And it was definitely a good kickoff to the show. Uh, so it was going to be a tough spot for the next match to follow up, the U.S. title match between Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho. And I thought it was funny when... Owens made his interest. They chose to put the video package there. That's right. One tubby tubby. Two tubby tubby. Dude needed a freaking break. He needed a breather so that way he wasn't blown up like Shane was during his damn match. Why the fuck he ran down that 80-yard ramp? I'll have no damn idea. Uh, but Owens-Jericho, this is one of those matches that had a lot of story to it going back to months. 
but it kind of just was there. And I think part of it is, is even the way that they ultimately got to this match still made no sense to me. Why the hell would Kevin Owens turn on Chris Jericho before his match against Goldberg at Fastlane? Why wouldn't he wait until afterwards after he lost? Because maybe Chris Jericho cost him it via distraction or something there. Uh, but you got here, and like I said, part of it could be that Shane and AJ stole a lot of the thunder from the crowd and took some of that energy away. Um, it was going to be really hard for a standard wrestling match to be able to follow that up. Uh, Owens and Jericho tried. I don't think they were terrible by any means. But again, the match was just kind of there. The right guy won. But even the finish was just kind of randomly thrown together and just didn't really get over. It kind of went over like a thud. Um, but again, right guy won. It wasn't terrible. But it's not something you're really going to remember. Nor should you remember this Raw Women's title fatal four-way match. Or now, excuse me, this elimination match. This is just stupid on so many different fucking levels. First and foremost... I think I saw it was on Yahoo. There was an article talking about how Charlotte could someday main event fucking WrestleMania. How about the bitch get through a match without botching something? Then we'll start talking about her getting a more prominent role at WrestleMania. Get over this feminazi bullshit with her penis power ass. The bitch is terrible. I'm sorry. Fuck all these people who try to talk about how great she is. She fucking sucks in the ring. Every match, you get multiple botches from her. And I just don't get what the big deal is about her. So, but anyways, and there was more. You, you, like, you threw Nia, Nia Jax in here at the last minute, which is cool. That way she gets a WrestleMania match. Just so that way she gets eliminated very quickly. You know, some will say, well, she wasn't really over, so it doesn't matter. Well, you know what? Maybe. But if you're going to throw her in there, at least have her do something, maybe? I don't know. Um... You know, Sasha got the best entrance of the four. Um, <laughs> best made me think that they were going to have her win. Of course, they would have had her win this year when last year all the stars fucking aligned for her to do it. When you had Snoop there and everything, all the momentum, all the energy was there for it, and they didn't do it. Well, they didn't do it again here. At least I could say they didn't have the one that wore the peacock, and how ironic is that, that Charlotte wore gear that was reminiscent of an animal with cock in their name. Uh, they went with Bailey. And this was just so stupid because if Bailey was going to win here, this is where she should have won the belt, not the previous show. This was dumb. If you were going to end Charlotte's pay-per-view streak, it should have happened here, not the last pay-per-view. And while the crowd kind of enjoyed it, this match was shit, and it didn't have nearly the impact that it could have. I don't like Bailey. But I don't deny moments. Her winning the belt for the first time at WrestleMania against these other three ladies would have been a moment. Her defending it when she's the face, even though her keeping the title went against what she should have been about, was just stupid because this company is stupid and this match was trash. Let's move on. And mercifully at this time, I was starting to feel the need for a little bit of a pick-me-up. And boy, I got it with that Raw Tag Team title ladder match. When I saw the New Day come out after the first three teams were out there, I said, oh, God. Either one or two things are going to happen. Either A, th this is going to lead to the right thing happening, or B, the New Day is going to put themselves in this tag title match, and they're instantly going to be the hottest heels of the night, not named Roman Reigns. Ultimately, cooler heads had prevailed, and the worst kept secret over the past week in professional wrestling uh, was finally revealed. They all knew the Hardys were coming back to WWE. It was just a matter of if it was going to happen tonight. Were they actually going to wrestle? Were they just going to make an appearance? Was it going to be the Raw after WrestleMania? Ultimately, the WWE made the right decision. It just doesn't feel like a ladder match at WrestleMania without the Hardy boys. And this was a moment. This was an outstanding moment. Now, it sucks for the perspective of Enzo and Big Cass that they didn't get to win the titles here at WrestleMania. But at the end of the day... We're talking about the tag titles, so frankly, who gives a shit? They can win those belts at some point in time later on down the road. This was about a moment. And the Hardys being back in WWE was a moment. A spectacular WrestleMania moment. And this is not just bringing in some part-timers to work a couple of times a year type of shit. These are guys that are still growing strong in the independent scene. These are guys that are doing some of the most interesting shit we see in professional wrestling. 
Now, granted, WWE will eventually sink their claws into him and try to ruin him, but for the time being, we can live in the fantasy world that all is good, and if it's not good, we can go up to WWE and say, delete, 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 and that this tag division on Raw is obsolete. It was a moment. Frankly, I thought the match went a little too damn long, but I understand you had the Hardys there, poor guys. They just worked the ladder match against the Young Bucks the night before, and now they're back in another fucking ladder match. Major props and respect to them for pulling that shit off. But them doing what they did, you get the traditional Jeff Hardy, is he going to die from doing this spot, ladder spot onto the fucking ladders, onto Sheamus and Cesaro, I think it was, or who the fuck was it? But does it matter? No, it doesn't fucking matter. The Hardys won the belt, and it was fucking awesome. It was fucking awesome. It was a real deal WrestleMania moment. So Shane versus AJ was a real highlight of the show. The Hardys returning. That was another pleasant surprise real highlight of the show. And since you didn't have people like The Rock there or Hogan there or Sting there or Austin there or Foley there or so on and so forth involved, you didn't get a ton of returns, but the returns you got meant something. And the Hardys were a big one. They weren't the only one of the night, but they were a big one. So at least you could say the ones that we did get mattered. So at this point in time, I'm still start I'm starting to feel good again about it. I'm like, okay, you know, we, we're four matches into the main card. Um, I've had one clunker, one just their match, and two matches that feel kind of WrestleMania worthy. And then here comes John Cena to fuck shit up. I mean, Jesus Christ, what can this dude actually do right? He's a fucking heel striker when he was running down the damn ramp, looking all types of fucking ridiculous. I can't imagine the gifts that you're going to see from him running down the ramp. <laughs> the, the match stunk. I mean, let's just call it how we see it. Because, of course, it was all going to be about Cena and Nikki getting their fucking moment. You know, the whole thing about the proposal, I think, would have meant a little bit more and carried more weight if they would have lost this match. Especially if Cena's going to take some time off and Nikki's going to take some time off. But <laughs> we're playing with Breakfast Club politics and Bella politics, apparently. They know what the hell they're doing. Um, as far as the proposal thing, you know, Macho Man Elizabeth, it is not... Like, you go back and watch that, and, and you see what feels like great acting, even though they had been married for seven years and all of that. You see Cena and Nikki Bella, and you know that he's already popped the question. They just saved that news for the actual pay-per-view, but he'd already done it. But what woman do you know gets popped the question, especially in that manner in front of all those people, wouldn't actually bust out and cry? And frankly, from the dude's standpoint... What dude, with all of the emotions that would be running through him about his life is ruined and everything else, and oh my god, this bitch is going to drive me to an early grave, a lot of dudes are going to get freaking emotional. And, and Cena and Nikki Bella couldn't even act well enough to evoke any type of real-looking emotions. It was fucking ridiculous. So people could think this is a cool moment, whatever. But my big thing about this whole thing is, is now that I was sitting there watching it with Ashley, all I had to hear about the whole fucking time this proposal was going down, oh, that's nice. Even John Cena can fucking propose to his lady. Hmm, not gonna wait forever, blah, blah, blah. So John Cena, from your heel-striking run to your crappy match where you just had, you two just had to go over Miz and Maurice to the proposal that leads to my misery, fuck you, Fuck you. Fuck you. Anyways, moving on. As bad as that was, I don't think anything was as bad as Seth Rollins versus Triple H. I had my concerns about this match going into it in large part because it went from the years of history between Seth Rollins and Triple H, uh, going all the way back to FCW, NXT, to The Shield, to... Uh, Seth Rollins being that next chosen one to Seth Rollins' knee injury and is he actually going to be able to wrestle at WrestleMania? And we get this match. And again, this is the problem with WWE having these incredibly long shows. Is sometimes they will pick and choose the wrong matches to go way too fucking long. 
And I know Hunter likes to go out there and put on these really long matches every year because, frankly, he only usually works one, maybe two matches a year at most. So God's going to get his time. But just because it can go that long doesn't mean it needs to. This was stupid on so many different fucking levels. I saw Lance Storm after the match tweeted about this, was retweeting, I think, something Gail Kim or somebody said, talking about the great psychology. What a stupid fucking opinion on this one. The psychology on so many different levels was so fucking dumb. First, this is an unsanctioned match. Yet, both of them come down the WWE ramp, have their entrance music, including Seth Rollins' WWE house music, being played over WWE sound system. We have it in a WWE stadium. We have WWE commentators. We have WWE refs, WWE graphics, WWE ring announcer. How is this unsanctioned? You can't sit there and talk about a hold harmless agreement and all of this crap, because if you talk about this being an unsanctioned fight, clearly the WWE is sanctioning it if they have all these WWE elements there. That makes no fucking sense. This is not an unsanctioned fight. I know some of the smart asses will talk about, well, they did a wish on and Hunter at SummerSlam 2002, but they saved that at least for the main event, I believe, if I remember. Or no, it wasn't the main event, it was the second to the last. So, you know what? Fuck it. Whatever. Yeah, that was fucking stupid, too. But even more so, at least with that match back in 2002, it went how it should have went, and it went to certain levels. This match was just really long, really stupid. Really stupid. This is no holds barred, anything goes. And it seems like the majority of it were working just a standard wrestling match where we're trying to hit high spots. Like, the epitome of the stupidity of all of this to me was Seth, Ro Seth Rollins coming out in his gold Power Ranger gear. He has a flaming fucking torch in his hand and doesn't bring it down to the ring to start the match. Triple H, who has his fucking <laughs> motor trike, he doesn't keep that down at the ring. I mean, it's just... God, this was terrible. It was just terrible. The psychology was where? When Seth Rollins was sitting there on the one hand selling his knee injury and then he was doing all types of flips and dark phoenix fuck stick moves. It was just dumb. Like even from the whole standpoint of it's unsanctioned, anything goes. Triple H rides out to the ring with his wife. Wouldn't you if you're Triple H rather run out to the ring with Samoa Joe? Wouldn't you just want to absolutely destroy this dude two-on-one? Or at least have this big fucking monster in your corner? You go with your wife? Your wife? She might have some impressive mom arms that could fuck some dudes up, but come on, dog. You're trying to send a message here. You send a message with Samoa Joe having your back. You don't get Sting involved. You don't have a Finn Balor. You don't do any of that shit. This shit was fucking lame. It was way too fucking long. And there was one point in time when Triple H had pinned Seth Rollins. I legitimately was just hoping that that was going to be the three counts so that way I could say praise God all fucking throughout the review. But even more so just because mercifully this match would have fucking ended. But no, it just went on and on and on and on. Again, just because you have a bunch of time doesn't mean you should use a bunch of time because eventually what happens, you have to rush some other shit later in the show because you didn't manage your time very well. Stop giving God a half hour for his fucking matches if they're not going to be any fucking good. These two guys are supposed to be like complete enemies, like completely despise each other. And they work most of it like a regular wrestling match. This was stupid. This was trash. This is one of the worst WrestleMania matches I've seen in a long time, which is a shame because it should have and could have been so much more. But the ironic thing was, it was the WWE title match that was everything is bad. I, I thought Rollins and Triple H was going to be the worst match of the night, and it probably still was. But Randy Orton versus Bray Wyatt was just brutal. As I've talked about before, the whole story about this is fucking stupid. 
So, of course, we get to this match. And, again, to the dipshit that tried to tell me this match was going to main event. How was my ass taped? Shut the fuck up. But, oh, my God. At least the one thing they did right with this is they waited for Bray Wyatt to make his entrance when it was dark. So that way he could see the fireflies. You know, that's a cool entrance to see. I'm sure in person. And it's a cool entrance to see when you're watching on pay-per-view on the network. But damn it, once you get past that, there's nothing there. I'm sorry, those graphics in the ring were fucking dumb. It's almost like Orton got bored of this shit. And he said, nah, dog, we're bringing this home early. RKO, let's get the fuck out of here. I mean, think about it. All, <laughs> all this match was about to me, and I tweeted this. All this match was about to me was Randy Orton's sleeve tattoos, Randy Orton's raging ring boner, Randy Orton finding a gopher hole, Randy Orton hitting an RKO, and Randy Orton posing with the title. That's what we got. This was terrible. Why the fuck did you put this belt on Bray Wyatt just to have him immediately lose it? This is a big power play by Randy Orton. LOL, Breakfast Club rules. LOL, Breakfast Club wins. <laughs> Let's give you a quick pose just for the fuck of it. God, this was terrible. Like I said, I didn't think it was going to get much worse with Rollins and Triple H. Uh, but it did, even though Rollins and Triple H are still worse because it went a lot longer. Wyatt and Orton was terrible. What a major disappointment. And a lot of people that are going to be pissed because Wyatt lost and how the match played out, who could fucking blame him? Because that shit sucked. Where the real irony comes in is the next match kind of put things back in perspective then. Saved the show temporarily for me. The universal title match between Lesnar and Goldberg. I, I was sitting there and I, I thought to myself, they're really going to have Goldberg make this entire entrance they couldn't have put his locker room, you know, closer to the ramp entrance. I'm just saying. Uh, but, man, you know, there's a lot of thought about how long this match was going to be, including entrances. Was it going to be 10 to 15 minutes? Was the match going to be three minutes or two minutes or five minutes or what the hell was it going to be? You know, this match is a perfect example of sometimes you don't need a bunch of time. It's about the time that you have and maximizing it and making the most of it. And these two dudes did. I mean... They took shit and made tasty chocolate pudding out of it. This match kicked ass for what it was. This had a big fight feel to it. Fuck all the rest holds and all this other shit. It's going to be quick hitting, high impact moves. Four minutes, 45 seconds, Bob's your uncle. We get all our shit in and we go fucking home. I love that fucking match. I love that Lesnar did business like this. I'm sure knowing ultimately he was going to go over at WrestleMania. But this is by far the most interesting thing that I think Lesnar has done in quite some time, especially during his return back to WWE since 2012. This is the most interesting Lesnar's been in quite a while. And for Goldberg, it felt to me in a way, a lot of this was just a, a makeup for how badly they screwed up things with Sting. You know, I appreciate the fact, as you can see with the shirt, that WWE actually did right by Goldberg. Goldberg did right here by putting over Lesnar at Mania. But God damn it, that match was fun. Not every match needs to go 20 or 30 fucking minutes. Not every match has to have a shit ton of high spots and fucking flips and kicks and crap. Sometimes it's nice to see two men that feel like they're big fucking deals, feel like they're men feel like their actual world championship material come out and kick ass for five minutes. I most certainly will take that over the 25-30 minute snooze fest that was fucking Rollins versus Triple H. That's for goddamn sure. But man, at this point in time, that match really helped me because I'm like, man, after, after the WWE title match and Rollins Triple H before that, you know, and Cena's dumb shit before that, I, I had lost pretty much all the luster that had come from Shane and AJ and the Hardys returning and winning the Raw Tag Team titles. I'm sitting there saying to myself, man, I need something. And I got that short-term adrenaline shot. Uh, the SmackDown Women's Championship match, frankly, who gives a shit? 
Naomi won the belt back. It, you could tell that these girls were told to rush. They were hurrying up trying to get all their shit in. And that's pretty much it. Again, it's stupid. You have Naomi win the belt at the last SmackDown pay-per-view just so that way she could surrender it even though she's back in time for Mania just to win it again. Imagine how much more the moment would mean if she actually won it for the first time in her hometown of Orlando at WrestleMania. Just saying. But it's cool that she won. Everybody can feel the glow, whatever. But even as that was going on, once the realization of Lesnar and Goldberg and when it was happening on the card um, happened, and even though that match was awesome, there's always something in the back of my mind because I know what that meant. And as I had talked about in the WrestleMania 33 preview show and, and tweeted about before that, um, especially looking at the circumstances and the situation, no matter what anybody said, Roman Reigns versus The Undertaker had to, and I emphasize again, had to, be the main event of WrestleMania 33. It had to. You had no choice. Because no matter what, nothing was going to be able to follow this. And if you didn't want to completely and totally kill and ruin your show, this match had to go on last. Now, unfortunately... You're sitting there and you're, you're saying, man, I've already been watching four and a half hours of this main car, two and a half, two hours of the pre-show. I can imagine those people that were down there at Orlando at this, which is how fucking hot they were and how tired they were. Feel bad for all those people that dealt with that blue light fucking blocking their view where they had to watch on the screens. You could have watched on your screen at home or in the hotel room um, and not dealt with all those stupid people at Mania. But man, you're sitting there and you're like, oh, four and a half hours of main card and we still got this match. You're just tired and you could feel it from that Orlando crowd. I don't think it was the greatest crowd of the night. They had their moments where they were really good, but a lot of it, a lot of the times they weren't very good. Now, sometimes that was a reflection of the fact that some of the shit on the show wasn't very good. Um, but God damn it all. Most of y'all were smart enough to know that this was potentially Taker's last WrestleMania match. You know this could have been the last ride at the ultimate thrill ride. I don't give a shit if I'm tired or not. I don't give a shit if I'm drunk or not. I don't give a shit if I'm stoned or not. I don't give a shit if I've got an appointment in 30 minutes to go hit the spank bank. This is the fucking Undertaker. Potentially his last match at WrestleMania. I don't give a shit if he's wrestling Roman Reigns. Or fucking dink the clown. God damn it. Get off your fucking hands. And at least get behind that dude. God, that pissed me off so bad. This is potentially The Undertaker's last match. And for a while, people are just silent. Why are you silent? Anyways, moving on. Yeah, there's no way to sugarcoat it. This match was bad. You could tell that they had mapped this out and pre-planned it. it. It just wasn't jiving. It wasn't gelling. It, it just, from an in-ring standpoint, was brutal to watch. It was tough to watch. It was tougher than, as I think JR used to say, what, tougher than a $2 steak? One of the highlights, though, was the return of Jim Ross. It was so fitting that he was there to call this match. I'm sure it meant a lot to him, and I'm happy for him that he got this moment. And it just felt like a bigger deal. Like, it was funny. You could hear, as JBL and Cole wouldn't shut the fuck up trying to tow the WWE corporate bullshit, as JR was actually bothering to tell, try to tell a story with the match, you could just hear that stark contrast in commentary styles. And sometimes you remember it to somewhat of a degree, but it doesn't really dawn on you until you hear it up close and personal, just how striking the difference is. JR, one type of commentator, trying to tell a story, sell what the action that's actually going on in the ring. And you got JBL and Cole talking all this bullshit about nobody gives a shit. It's like the WWE sent out JR, but they felt like they had to cover for JR. No, JR covers for JBL and Cole, sorry asses. They don't cover for him. Anyways. Yeah, this match was bad. And in particular, when we got that horribly bad spot where Reigns wasn't able to reverse into that tombstone. <sighs> I don't know much that could have saved it at that point in time. Because it was already not on good footing. And 
Yeah, it was just, it's tough to watch. It was tough to watch. A guy that has meant so much to me and so many others as WWE fans, as wrestling fans, to the company, frankly, to the talents, to everybody, for so many years, to see him have to go out like this was tough. It was really tough. And, you know, when you got to the end, it's ironic because the match did ultimately tell a story. To me, it told the story that for even the dead man, uh, Father Time is still undefeated. And you think that these heroes, these icons, these legends can go on forever, but they're human at the end of the day, and they just can't. So it kind of tells the story of the guy who hung on too long, the guy who stayed a few years past his prime, uh, the guy who still wanted to do it, that still had the passion to do it, but no longer had the physical ability to do it. You still appreciated the greatness of his specter, his aura, his legacy. But as you watch that match, the reality really sunk in that this is the end of the road. And it was time. It was time. So, you know, as where a couple of years ago, when the WWE idiotically ended the streak, uh, like they did, you know, I was all pissed off and mad initially, and then still linger some resentment for it to this day, and that probably will never go away. You know, as, as much as I'm sure a lot of people are going to be pissed that Roman Reigns won this match, Roman Reigns was in this spot, Roman Reigns couldn't even carry Taker in his last match to a decent match, I get all that, but at the end of the day, I wasn't even that mad when Taker lost. It almost feels like a bit of a burden lifted off of me. Because, you know, trying to pretend that he was in a better place physically and as a performer than he actually was, you know, all good things must come to an end. And as he left his gloves and his coat and his hat in the ring, you know, that was a moment. And at the end of the day, for my money, The Undertaker is the GOAT of WWE. He is their greatest of all time. He is, to me, the real true Mr. WrestleMania. Fuck Shawn Michaels. Um, but it was just so evident, even as bad as the match was, as pissed as people were going to be about Reigns winning, there was nothing that could follow this match. The WWE got this right. If that was the match you were going to get from The Undertaker, this was the finish to this show you were going to have. Imagine putting this shit in the fucking mid-card and trying to recover from it. That was part of the crap that really hurt WrestleMania 24. Was Flair Michaels went out mid-card. Nothing could fucking foul Flair's retirement match. Nothing. No matter what they did. Imagine the dead man. Even if you think about it that way, you want to sit there and say, well, WrestleMania 30, Daniel Bryan fouled it, did he? Maybe, maybe not. As I've referenced three years ago, and I still maintain, that's the yeah, but WrestleMania. Yeah, Daniel Bryan won the title, was the Breakfast Club killer that night, but he's no longer an active wrestler. Yeah, Daniel Bryan won the title, but the Undertaker streak ended. Is that the trade-off you really wanted? You remember that show for the Taker streak ending more so, I think, than Daniel Bryan winning the damn title that night. Nothing could follow it. Nothing. And imagine this, not just the streak ending, but you're talking about the GOAT of WWE hanging him up his last match, his last time wrestling at WrestleMania. Nothing was going to follow that. And it was a moment. It was a real moment. Yeah, you could tell the emotions were getting to him. Surely the emotions were getting to a lot of the people there. You know, I had a lot of emotions myself. You know, there's, there's sadness because this is a man that I respect more than anybody in the history of professional wrestling business. And I know that it's very likely the last time I'll ever see him wrestle again. Part of what I held on to every year was the opportunity to be able to be that little kitty mark for The Undertaker every year come WrestleMania. 
And if I didn't lose that a few years ago, when the streak was ended, that most certainly is gone for me now. You know, it's also a bit of a representation of my evolution as a wrestling fan over the years. The Undertaker debuted back when I was nine years old at Survivor Series 1990. He's been through it all. The Hogan era, that next generation, the Attitude era, the Ruthless Aggression era, the PG era, the reality era. He's been there through all that bullshit. And I've been there right along with him. During the Monday Night Wars, all throughout the 90s just in general, all these guys coming and going between WCW and WWF, but it was The Undertaker, once he got there in 1990, he never left. Where all these other dudes jump ship. The Hogans, the Halls, the Natchez, the Savages, the DiBiases, the so on and so forth. So Mr. Perfect, Kurt Hennings. All these guys jump ship. Bret Hart. The Undertaker was the bedrock. He was the foundation. He was the constant. He was the on-screen leader in a lot of ways. He was the locker room leader. And to me... He truly became the ultimate measuring stick of what a WWE superstar should be and is supposed to be. So, you know, watching him for the last time at WrestleMania, it, it was weird. You're happy to see him one more time. You're mad that he lost his last WrestleMania match. You're sad because it's his last WrestleMania match. But you know what? All good things must come to an end. It's that simple. Taker is the greatest of all time for WWE, in my opinion. All I can say is hashtag thank you, Taker. It was the only way you could have ended this show. In terms of my overall opinion of WrestleMania 33, it's tough. Because there were some real highlights. Shane versus AJ was really damn good. But again, that was the opening match. Uh, the Hardys coming back to WWE winning the Raw Tag Team titles was awesome. But then that was followed up by the John Cena bullshit and Rollins and Triple H's disaster and Randy Orton's Bray Wyatt's disaster. And while you got Goldberg and Brock Lesnar, I thought, rocking shit out for the four minutes, 45 seconds that they wrestled, you know, that's not enough to make it a great show. And surely you're going to have people tell you it's a great show. You're going to have people tell you it's a phenomenal show. It was not. There were too many crappy matches for this to be a great show. The show was far too damn long. Now, some of the people that were maybe there in person maybe were able to enjoy it. And, and I understand if they were. Because there is a difference in watching it in person and watching it at, on pay-per-view at home, on your computer, or your tablet, your device, whatever. But from my perspective, watching this at home... It was an adequate WrestleMania. Just adequate. And ultimately, the thing I'll remember it for is going to be Taker's last ride. So I'm probably going to want to compartmentalize and block off this WrestleMania because it's kind of like watching Taker tonight. You know what it reminded me of? And I hate to say this, but it reminds you of somebody who's at death's door and you see them and let's say cancer has ravaged their body and they used to be healthy and so vital and full of life and now you see them, they're a 90 pound shell of themselves and then they pass away and you go to the funeral and you see, the, see them in the open casket and it's tough because it can sometimes take a little bit when you see them one last time to pay your respects that that isn't the lasting enduring image of them is that they're dead. You hope that eventually those memories come back from their life and the good times and the happy times and so on. Seeing The Undertaker tonight wrestle and be just a broken down, frankly, battered shell of a man of what he once was as a performer and as a talent was sad. And it probably will take a little while, frankly, for me to get that image out of my head because that's the last image I have of him as an in-ring competitor. And surely I will. And surely others will too. It's just a weird vibe. It's a weird vibe. And at the end of the day, it's all that really matters about this show, let's be honest. The only thing that truly, truly matters is that this was Taker's last ride. 
That's it. What else could follow that? And all, only other thing I can say is thank you, Taker.